So um, hello and welcome to the Playwright Center. Uh, and this is the continuation of our weekly public conversations as part of our new spring season of programming here at the Playwright Center. Uh, we have folks tuning in online from all around the country to be with us today. And we are sending all of you um, from coast to coast and everywhere in the middle so much good energy and health right now uh, in this moment of uncertainty. We at the Playwright Center are gathering to tell stories and to listen to artists and who we really believe are our great leaders um, to discuss the issues of moments like this in time. Um, my name is Jeremy Cohen. Uh, I'm the producing artistic director here at the Playwright Center and also here in my house, the artistic director of my house. Um, and uh, I wanna thank you for joining us today. We're so grateful that you're choosing to spend your time with us right now. So just a few more bits of business uh, as Julia was uh, mentioning, just to let you know how the, the structure of the conversation today will go. Um, again, you'll be able to hear and see Jess and, Jessica and I, uh, but, uh, and then we'll have a Q&A portion um, that I'll explain to you how to do that in a moment, uh, in a little bit. If you have any trouble at any point, please feel free to use the chat function, uh, and Julia can kind of pop on and help you figure stuff out if you need anything. Um, as Julia mentioned, we're recording the conversation today. We are looking at lots of ways right now, um, including these conversations for creating more accessibility for more people um, and really trying to seize this opportunity to take a lot of the work we're doing around accessibility at the Playwright Center and really expanding it outward. So um, you'll see more and more of that in our programming as the weeks continue on. Um, and then again, sort of structurally, Jess and I will talk for about the first uh, chunk of the conversation today, and then we'll reserve the last third or so to hear questions from you um, and, and open up that discussion. Um, when we're about five minutes out from those questions, I'll let you know that that's the time when you should go ahead and use the Q&A function rather than before that, um, uh, which is at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and then you can go ahead and fill those out. And then uh, Jessica and I will be kind of sharing and answering uh, responses there. Um, as I mentioned at the center, we're, we're really busy rolling out this new spring season of programming. And part of that is to ensure that we can continue conversations like today uh, as we seek solace in one another as we uh, find our own answers on any given day at any given moment with one another. And the other big part of that though was that we thought if we came up with an idea where we could pay and support over 200 playwrights and actors and directors over the next few months to compensate them for their time, uh, that would be really critical. So if you are interested in joining us for any more of this programming, please check it all out at pwcenter.org and sign up for whatever moves you to do. Everything is free uh, and um, we're paying all the artists. So there you go. Um, today, we're so fortunate to have with us the one and only Jessica Huang. Uh, Jessica's work, for those of you that are just getting to know her, includes the amazing Paper Dreams of Harry Chin, Mother of Exiles, Transmissions in the Advance of the Second Great Dying, and the Incredible Purple Cloud. Jessica has commissions with Manhattan Theater Club currently, Timeline Theater, Audible, Theater Masters, History Theater, and Theater Moo. She's the inaugural recipient of the Four Seasons Residency. She was a 2018 McDowell Fellow, a three-time Playwright Center Fellow, and is graduating <laughs> next month from Juilliard's Playwriting Program. Welcome, Jessica. It's so good to have you. Thanks, Jeremy. So Jess, as we've been kind of going through this moment together, all of us, we're, we're, I think we're trying to remain learning to remain teachable to all the whole new ideas and new understandings of the world. That's at least what we've been talking a lot about at the center, um, really deeply leaning into um, sort of that service organization, those muscles we've been developing over time, the work to support artists, their work, their lives, health insurance, all of it. Mm -hmm. um, that really is remaining at the forefront of what we're doing right now. Um, and of course, on the other hand, we're, we're all just humans. So we are, as we were just talking about, already you know, facing our own fears, our frailty, our uncertainty, um, and then also looking at places where we are finding inspiration in moments. So less like uh, success or metric-based <laughs> inspiration and really like in this moment, my heart is singing for 34 seconds and that is great today, you know, <laughs> um, figuring out the places where we find that. Um, and so we wanted to have some of these conversations to root that out. <laughs> with some of the artists who have been part of our family for, for a long time. So there's all these ideas about how any of us are approaching our work and really our process, our processes with grace, with humility, with trusting our own voices, with challenging what we thought we knew, but 
also knowing that listening even deeper right now could reveal something else entirely. And I think it's made so many of us, the folks that I'm talking to, think about the opportunity that's in front of us right now. I just came out of a conversation with the amazing Jack Ruler this morning about that very thing at Mixed Blood. How are we seizing this opportunity? And that as theater artists, the idea of change, of reinvention, that's part of our DNA as theater makers, as generative artists like you, like a playwright. It's a natural piece of any part of all artistic processes. And I think even more so now we're seeing this time where we are looking to artists like you, Jessica, our scrappy, brilliant, expressive thinkers and storytellers <laughs> who have demonstrated it as I've watched for the last 10 years with you, your own leadership um, throughout many periods of time and many different processes in many different ways. And I have stayed learning from you every step of the way. And so it's a real thrill to be in conversation with you this morning. So Jessica and I thought we would try to balance the conversation today between discussing some of your approaches, um, Jess, to developing work from a more logistical standpoint, but also I think from a more emotional collaborative place as well. I have lots of questions right now about how <laughs> this field has approached play development in the past and collaboration prior to this moment in time. And I am wondering a lot about things we're learning to lean into now or things that we are realizing we need to let go of. So our humility, our fear, our curiosity, our ego, possibility for things to be different than we ever even thought could happen. All of these, I think, different dynamics come into play in a process and they teach us over time, I think, if we listen to them. Um, and I guess a reminder to all the friends at home that you know, you're just hearing from Jessica and I in the first part of this conversation and that um, these are just our opinions and we're really looking forward to hearing your thoughts and opinions in the second part of the conversation as well. So I always say that as we talk about this stuff because there's no answer, there's no right, there's just what we're doing right now. Um, so Jess, I'm wondering if we could start off, you know, again, I, I have spent the last 10 years you were one of the first artists I met and got to know in the Twin Cities no. years ago. And I, I think about you as one of the, um, from moments like hearing the first time I actually read a play of yours to the first time we sat across from each other to um, being at your wedding with the incredible <laughs> Lori Carlos. And thinking about all these moments along the way, and I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about your story, how sort of you kind of became a playwright in a way. Um, how did you get to your process? Yeah, ha happy to. And I just, it's so wonderful every time I get a chance to connect with you because it is, I think, I, in some ways it's embarrassing, but I feel like you watched me become not only a playwright, but like an adult. <laughs> <laughs> so I, was, I was really figuring it out when we first met. And so it's, it's been, I don't know, it's such a, a joy it's, it's a joy to be here in my parents' house in Minneapolis in the middle of this moment with family. And it's, it's really a joy to be talking to you, also family, in the middle of this moment. It's, um, it, yeah, it's really special. So thank you. Thank you for the very wonderful, sweet things you said and the questions you're asking. I, I'm so appreciative of them also. Um, uh, the question is, background as a as a playwright and person and um i i was uh it's funny to be here where i grew up right now thinking about that and um i was always a dramatic kid and loved stories my dad read stories to me when i went to bed and i made plays for my friends in the basement when we were when we were kids but i never really knew that um that that was a job that people had. I just sort of thought that was sort of a, a game to play. And as I came up in, uh, I don't know, my, my entire sort of school age years, I was always a writer. I was always being sort of celebrated as a writer. And I was always in love with stories and in love with theater and in love with performance. Um, but it took me until I was in college to, to put two and two together and, and realize that I could you know, have a job that was being a writer of the things that I love to experience. So I, I guess all of that is to say that I started out as a, as a fan and I, I, and I was a journalist throughout college and for a, a very short time afterward. And um, 
uh, the moment when I decided to be a playwright was um, was a like a personal sort of moment of catastrophe in a way. I was having it was in my first job as a journalist, and um, I had taken a few playwriting classes and had fallen in love and had felt that sort of almost chiropractic feeling of alignment when something just clicks for you, and and so I had felt that, um, but I hadn't found the courage or the I don't know wherewithal to make a life in that in that way and so I was working as a journalist in Arizona at a time when journalism was was under a huge transition watching the way the the field was responding to that to this moment of transition which was basically just to online news and this this online news cycle um, and uh, and feeling myself unable to tell the kind of stories I wanted to tell or respond to the world inside of the constraints of the form of journalism um, and lonely and going through a breakup and like the whole <laughs> shebang. And, uh, and it, was, it was sort of like in that moment of, um, of confusion and, and not knowing that I decided to just follow the thing that I loved more than anything and that felt so right um, and then and then that began sort of a process of of understanding what could that look like and figuring it out for myself um, and waiting tables and cleaning houses all along the way to make a living um, but I think that that I just in thinking about where we are right now how sometimes these moments where the bottom drops out and you're just sort of left with, you're left with the things you know to be true about yourself. I knew I was a writer. I knew I was dramatic. I knew I wanted to somehow contribute to the world. And I knew that the only way that I knew how to do that was through writing and maybe in this creative way. That felt like the only sort of light to follow. Wow. That's clarion in a moment like this, isn't it? Yeah. Do you think you knew it? Did Like, as you're saying that now, even three months ago, would you have said it exactly in that way? Or do you feel like there's a new understanding even in the last month or so? Yeah, it's certainly a new understanding, I think. Just, I mean, there's, there's clarity that comes with, you know, sleeping in your childhood bedroom <laughs> and, uh, and, and sort of looking at yourself that way. And then also just being in another moment where the bottom is dropping out of, for so many people and, and but also, having that like firm grasp on what like how how to be a participant how to contribute to the world you know we know what our gifts are I think and yeah so maybe let's talk about as where you kind of ended up through that filter a little bit let's talk about your process right I mean what what whatever that word means and I guess it, it being that it's so evolutionary for any of us who we are as a person who we are as an artist what our work is and looks like how it develops how we collaborate all of that I guess maybe <clears throat> right so maybe here's a two-part question answer what you will <laughs> what are some things that you've been learning more recently about what's important to you in a play development process. Let's be tactical about it, I guess, in some ways. Um, and you can be as, they can be as, you know, logistical or as emotional or creative as, as, they, as you want them to be. So what are things you've learned re recently about a play development process that are important to you specifically? And then maybe also, I'm curious, what's maybe the largest dynamic in that process or in those processes that has shifted about your work over time? Yeah. I, I was thinking about, about this before we were talking today about process and where does it begin? Because I think that the play development process is an extension of the whole process, which begins, I think, which, and I think for me, it all kind of looks the same. So I, this is sort of maybe a backdoor into this question. Yeah. So forgive me if I ramble a bit, but, um, but I, I think about, my, my dad is a scientist, and so I grew up really um, uh, 
I'm, the only word coming to my mind is worship, but I don't know if that's the right word. Worshiping data and experimentation and, and proof. And so there's so much of my process, both um, before the, the workshop room and, um, and inside of it that has a lot to do with, with um, tracking and, and hypothesis and uh, the scientific method in some ways. Um, so, so in the writing process, what I, I do a lot of, um, I have sort of like three types of work that I'll make. I'll make like a subconscious document, which is like a free writer journal, and then a conscious document that's like outlining and um, sort of constructing what I think the play is. And then there's the script itself, which is then the, the script, you know, and that is almost like the, it's execute the program, you know, see what, if all of that stuff is, is working. And then the, the play development, process the workshopping process when I get to hear it with actors is I think a, an, ex, an extension of that sort of print and process uh, run run script version of it so I'm listening to hear whether um, what I've written is working I'm hearing characters in embodied in a way that you know does it translate from my head to another person uh, is the is the internal logic sound or was I sleep deprived the moment that I was trying to construct X, Y, and Z. Um, so for me, there's a lot of listening in all phases. And then, you know, getting a suspicion that this might be the way the play wants to be and then trying it out in, in various forms. And one majorly important form of experimentation is with collaborators in development. Um, so that that is overall what I think about when I think about new play development process. And, um, and I think a thing that I've been, like the one thing that I would take away from this past year or, or so of doing workshopping is that I have, I'm a, um, I'm a Sagittarius and I, am, I was born in the year of the tiger. And so I have, um, I attribute my my desire to constantly be active and run with it and like go 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 I attribute it to those two things and my pace is a quick pace and I like to just if I get the idea I want to go with it all the way and what I've been really learning is about um, how to you know restrain myself a little bit and think and um, and so I'm working on not making too many changes in the moment and instead going home and thinking about things because my impulse is to just be like, yeah, yeah, good idea. And then just, you know, make an adjustment in the room and not be inside of the characters, not be inside of the writing, but instead be inside of an editor. And I have to, I'm learning that I have to make big changes or small changes inside of the writer instead. Is there something um, incited that learning for you? Like a, a certain moment, either in process, in your writing process or, or a rehearsal room or something like that? Yes. Uh, I had, so I've, I've been, my play, The Paper Dreams of Harry Chin, has had a, a funny little life where it had a production in 2017, and then it went through some more development, and then it was just about to have another production right as, right as the pandemic shut the theater industry down. Um, so I was able to sort of be in in the mind of uh, of like the the first rehearsal for a new play, both in 2017 and now, mm -hmm. um, and in 2017, I think my tendency was this other thing was to be in the room, see what wasn't working, make a lot of changes, um, and then you know go home and sleep and come back the next day and not spend a lot of time outside of the room thinking about what was going on, but instead try and be really responsive to the creators that I was working with, and then um, this time around. I came into the process telling um, the wonderful director I was working with, Jackie Bradley, um, I, I told her, I know my tendency is to go too fast and to take too many notes in the room and get a bit confused. So help me. And she was wonderful. And so every time I started to write, she's like, why don't you go home and think about this? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good collaborator, right? There. Yes, yes. <laughs> And at the end of the day, the script now feels, it feels like all the changes that I made in this process are very intrinsic to the story I was telling and not necessarily to the actors in the room or the, the 
or you know my own fear in the, or intimidation in the rehearsal process or my overconfidence or whatever it just feels like organic you were saying something a quick moment ago about I'm going to say it wrong, but sort of the difference between the change happening within the writer and what's happening within the play or something like that. Yeah, the, the editor. <laughs> so I think the, you know, the caps you wear as a writer, there's like the person that I, that feels like to me almost just um, like half sort of conduit or listener to, to characters and people that, um, haven't yet manifested on this plane and then half maybe scientist or experimenter who's um, testing to see if this is how they are together that's the writer but then and it's it feels very um quiet I feel very quiet as like Jessica feels very quiet in that moment mm -hmm. and it's more just about being open and allowing a story to come through in that sort of oscillating between receiving it and then testing it and then in the rehearsal room I feel like Jessica is forward you know and it's my um my artistic sensibility and my taste and my um sometimes my penchant for cheesiness or my <laughs> my tolerance for it or my um desire to laugh whatever all the things that I as an audience member almost want is the person that's coming in to edit and so um, making big choices while I'm just trying to, while Jessica is so there, makes it difficult for the, the play to organically flow the way that it needs to. Does that make sense? This is the first time I'm articulating that, I guess, out loud. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not to be that guy, but it does feel like so much of what you're saying right now feels like this moment, which is, do we try to force a narrative and then feel our own internal tension and frustration when the narrative, because we're in, in the way of it, we're not letting the story happen. The truth is this thing is, there are things that are out of our control right now and those are many. And as you shared earlier, that is a struggle for so many of us. And then there's the things that we actually do have some ability to affect change or with. And, and I think finding, maybe it's serenity prayer, but finding the, you know, finding that balance point between those things in the writing process, in the generative process, is as critical as it is, I think, kind of spiritually for any of us right now, as we just, oh, it's Tuesday, it's rainy and gray here today. How do I go with the thing I am and get out of my own way? You know, I'm wondering if those are things we're gonna to continue to learn as you're talking at them in the process <laughs> and how we take those forward into our work, you know? Yeah, I think it's so true. I've, I've been, um, my, some, I was on a call with some family members earlier today and everyone was saying, are you getting a lot of writing done? Are you getting a lot of writing done? Um, do, do you have new ideas from this moment? I'm like, I'm getting a lot of writing done about, you know, the 1930s and about <laughs> like a, a dragon lion hybrid, but I'm not. <laughs> that is the Jessica longest thing I have ever heard you say. <laughs> Obviously that is the writing that you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I just love it so much. Okay, so one of the things we talked about, we were saying this earlier uh, yesterday in, in a different conversation, one of the things we talk about at the Playwright Center all the time, so you've heard me say this for years, is that we really, you know, with writers, when you're coming as a fellow, we're saying you are the artistic director of your time here at the Center, right? And when, especially when it comes to workshopping a play, if we said you need to have this director and you must have a dramaturg and you can have Rehearsal only can go like this, rather than saying, what will help unlock the play for you? What's the process for you in this moment, in this way that will kind of help take that forward? Um, I think we think it's really critical because playwrights are oftentimes not one of the leading voices in those conversations when it comes in production. And you're talking about the great, you know, Jackie in terms of like what she's doing to say, no, I'm putting Jessica forward, you know, in this room. Um, I'm, I guess I, you know, as we, I continue to hear from writers that that continues to be a rarity, you know, in the, uh, in the room as, as critical decisions about a play are getting made. And sometimes it's assuming, it's assumed it's around like design and it's like, well, the player doesn't need to be part of that conversation or it's around casting. Well, they have to be part of that because it's in the contract, you know, whatever that is. <laughs> it sort of is antithetical to the idea of like, right, but we're all here because Jessica wrote something and now we're all here around that thing. So I'm curious, if you can kind of talk to us a little bit about how you approach the idea of self-advocacy in the process and maybe 
you were getting at this a moment ago, but where is that line between trusting your voice, trusting your instincts, but then sometimes being overly protective of stuff that you're like, oh, I wish I had let go of that, you know? Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think um, this, it feels like such a key for me personally, which is just to slow down a little bit. Um, because, you know, like I said, fire signs, I always want to like flare up and I either in like complete excitement and onboardness for whatever ideas come through or whoever it is that we want to bring into the room. Um, or I like will get very defensive or something very quickly. And so I, I think that my like my lesson in life is to slow down a little bit. And, and certainly in this in in terms of how to how to decide how to advocate for myself even in the first place I think it's about it's about taking a moment and um, and first checking in with myself to see uh, to see what's true I think my my body is the best bellwether for um, for any decision that I've ever made I always seem to know it in the body before I really understand intellectually what I think or feel and um, and so th this animal that is my body has been the best way for me to first of all just know whether this is a moment to step forward or step back, um, and and then and then the next I don't know I think the next phase of that process is it's a return I think I I guess. Well, I'm thinking about self-advocacy and I think about how it starts for me and um, there's a I have a practice of it I think it's about always protecting the work and um, so there's the body as the bellwether and then the work is the sort of newborn baby that we have to all stand behind and make sure is um, is safe and for me I think um, there's so much about that that happens before we're even in a moment of a conflict or a moment of decision there's the part where like I have to get to my desk in the morning and that uh, is a, is sometimes that's advocacy it can be um, there's so many things that can get in the way of it there's family there's responsibilities there's a dog that we now have had for a year and uh, and and figuring out how to put the work ahead of that sometimes or where the work belongs in terms of the hierarchy of my family or of my day um, that that is its own form of advocacy and um and i'm here with my parents right now and we're navigating like being like parent child roommates in like this new world and my writing time i, I know i'm a i'm a morning writer and i know i need to get at my desk and it's so it can be such a challenge uh to like the small ways of navigating how can i get how can i get through breakfast to the part of my time that's my writing time and how can I make sure that even though I'm writing I'm not in an office I'm not in a room with a closed door I'm just in the corner how can I make sure that that is still a protected space and um, and the strategies that I find myself using to protect my work and my writing are strategies then that apply throughout the rest of my life you know it's it's first of all it's me needing to do it first me needing to advocate to Jessica that this is important um, and that sometimes comes through like things like routine. Um, so getting um, clinging to routine, not because it is uh, at all valuable in any way other than that it will shoot you out at the end of the day at your desk, you know. So, it's, you know, whatever, it's like meditation and then from meditation you walk to the desk every time. And um, uh, and then there's like the, the, the conversations and how to, how to navigate with other people that you love and trust and who need things from you, how to say that, you know, yes, but afternoon, it has to be afternoon every time, you know? Um, and I think that, that looking at it as a practice, as a daily practice makes it a lot easier to do that work inside of a more difficult situation in terms of negotiating contracts or um, or like you're saying, you know, having to like fight to be inside of a marketing conversation, or whatever those things are. It's still about this, you know, this precious gift 
that I've been given, the story that I've been given to tell the world. And if, um, if I, you know, if I'm, if the wrong, I don't know, the wrong image is in the marketing, then that isn't going to be, <laughs> then that like precious gift isn't going to be shared with the world the way that I know I'm, I'm charged to share it. Um, and so then it's the same, it's just the same thing. I think I'm wondering a little bit about, um, do you have sort of an example of when your body as that barometer alerted you, hey, look over here or look over here or put the thing down or pick the thing up. Like, it's interesting hearing how your writing process and routine and ritual kind of free you in certain sorts of ways. Um, and I'm curious if there's been anything in the development process or collaborative process where, and it can be a really positive thing or, or not, which is like, yeah, this was like that body as, as bellwether um, <laughs> uh, had taught me something. Yeah, I guess I, I, um, well, I was recently developing, I have, I'll, I'll have a, a sort of an, a moment where my body was protecting the work and a moment where my body was, um, sort of embracing sharing the work. I have one of each and I can think about a time in a, in the recent, you know, workshopping process and um, Through nobody's fault. It was one of those like sort of blind dates with new collaborators um, There I, The the development room like I was saying before I, it's it can be hard for me to stay inside of this writer mind this is embodied person and I I'm so um easily convinced sometimes by the information coming through. So sometimes what my body is, or my work is telling me is that I need to just, you know, put, put a stop to whatever the conversation is. And it's only because I'm starting to find myself confused and easily swayed by everybody's con very convincing and thought through arguments. And, um, and so in, in a, in a recent workshopping process, that was, that was starting to happen. And I, and I was still, I, w I felt like I was doing a pretty good job, but then by the time the reading happened, I was watching a play that was not my play. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that was the time when I was able to check back and sort of see the times in which I had not uh, sort of stood my ground and said, let's just, let just move on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, but, other, but in, in other, in other moments, I think, um, there's sort of this, this sort of, this like, I don't know, this feeling of affirmation, this like hard yes, that's like, this is so exciting. And usually it happens not because somebody has an idea that they're talking about, it's because some actor is making some amazing choice. And so suddenly the play, like I can just feel where the play is like alive in this way and it wants to continue down that path, but instead I've like made it veer to the side and no amount of conversation around the table is gonna teach me that one thing. It's just the, you know, it's just an actor being brilliant and like the play suddenly arrives. Mm -hmm. And I think those, that feeling of exhilaration and excitement is like, uh, is, what, is what it's all about. And so then advocacy looks like, oh my gosh, talk to me about what you were thinking or can we do that again and just like you know just like you know move forward with what you're imagining does this feel more right than that and it just becomes a conversation i think of collaboration versus i don't know any anything else in about five minutes we're going to um open up the conversation for some questions from folks um who are joining us today so uh this would be the time i guess if you have something you want to ask jessica here um, go to the bottom of the screen and you're going to see that Q&A button and you can click that and then we'll kind of start queuing up some questions or discussions there. Um, if you have any questions about that, Julia can help you out with that as well. I guess just kind of coming then full circle, kind of let's maybe transition a little bit to the theater field in this country right now and how you contextualize more public feedback in response to readings of new plays. Um, and, I, and, and one of the reasons I was excited to talk to you specifically about this is that I think your work in particular deals with Im immigration, it deals with climate crisis, it deals with like really big, not just global sized issues in a lot of the work, but sort of um, 
the, the levels, the theatrical levels, the poetry, the lyricism that exists, the where ghosts play roles, where um, the living and the dead ex coexist with one another. There's all these layers to your work. And so I guess I'm curious as a generative artist in a pretty conservative theater field still, um, how do you think about feedback, especially in a public setting? And I guess maybe even especially in a world right now where so many writers are saying, I, you know, I don't know what the theater field looks like going forward after this. And I don't know how I fit into all of that. And I'm kind of thinking about, I'm curious about your thoughts on like, how, what does pub, really public feedback mean to you now? Or, or do you think it will mean to you now instinctively? Um, that, I think that's such a great, that's such a great question um, because so much, so much of our, like the real feedback is so public, whether it's, you know, a review or a talk back or something. And we're really, I mean, I do believe that I make my work for an audience. And um, not only do I believe I make my work for an audience, I know specifically who I make my work for. And I would, I hope to include and, and wrote more and more people into that sort of select group of audience people. Um, but and, and so, so audience feedback, critical feedback, all of that I think is really important and it's important to me. And I can think of, there's an example, I just brought this play about climate change to a theater in, um, in California. And it was, you know, we had a workshop and then a public conversation later. And, and I, um, I, you know, live in, we, we all talk about like the bubbles we live in and I certainly live in my own <laughs> echo chamber and I wasn't really anticipating um, the, that a theater going audience would have such a conservative sort of viewpoint about climate change. But here it was this play about climate change and then we had the talk back and the talk back had nothing to do with things that it feels like, where were you bored? Where were you <laughs> interested? You know, like those typical talk back conversations, what impacted you? It was all suddenly about um, the science and the, the, you know, whether or not it was true, because this play takes place, you know, um, 50 <laughs> some years in the future and climate change has happened, is happening. And so the world is impacted by the climate. and. Um, and suddenly there's people saying that's not true. That's, you know, it seems like you're, you're spouting that, those lies about climate. And, and I was really not prepared for it. Um, and, uh, and I think the best, the best sort of outcome of that was, first of all, understanding that the play is impactful in some way because it got an entire room of people very excited. There was a, a group of people that were very conservative and then a group of young people from a nearby college. And so it became this, this generational conversation about, um, about the climate and who's responsible and, and are we responsible and all of this. And at the end, the sort of universal truth that rang out is that um, something is happening. We don't know what it is or what to call it or whose fault it is, but something is happening and we all want to help. And so finding that sort of common ground was sort of a powerful way to move forward. And then that was something that I was able to take back when I went back to the play. And instead of sort of spouting my liberal <laughs> anarchist viewpoint, I was able to sort of incorporate this, this wow. fundamental truth, which is that we all do want to help in some way. Um, and, and so I found that very useful. And then when I was able to, when I went back to that theater with a play about immigration, I was also able to couch or to frame it, I guess in a way before we saw the reading, you know, I, I was able to invite an audience that maybe came from a lot of different places to unite around the fact that, you know, travel is a part of our lives, being a stranger is a part of our lives, and how can we watch this play from that place? Um, and then in that way, the feedback that I received was much more personal to each audience member and helped me with the play itself a bit more. Mm. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, pose a couple questions to you from our audience. Amazing. Uh, this is coming in from Rebecca Frost. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks for being with us today. Um, she writes, story. You talk about commitment to story. I come from a movement background and other creative writing. The embodied act is native to me. 
mm. dialogue to. I have a feel for it. I constantly feel sheepish because story doesn't feel intuitive to me. Can you talk about any of this? Oh, I love, thank you, Rebecca. Um, I think, and recently story, the word story has become in, in my, I think I use it too much because I've, I, I don't mean to be exclusive when I say story, and I don't necessarily mean beginning, middle, end, you know, the story we're, we're taught to tell in school. I think I'm, I'm speaking more about the transference of experience from one to another. And for me, that often comes through in a narrative way. But I know my experience in the world, that sort of transference is sometimes, um, you know, unutterable. It's something that is much more felt. And, um, and I think what I'm ta when I when I talk about defending story, or when I talk about um, devoting myself to it, what I'm really talking about is just devoting myself to that um, powerful impulse to share with another person the thing that I know. Hmm. Know in your head, know in your gut, know in your body. I, or that I, yeah, no, I guess know in my, know in my gut, know in my body that I have received, the gift I've received <laughs> from the universe around me or the world around me or my grandparents or who knows. But it's a thing that I, that feels fundamentally true and I, I wish to share it. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, this is coming in from Donna in San Diego. Hi, Donna. Welcome. Um, how many collaborators do you need? The more, not always, the merrier? Uh, <laughs> I read your plays just to my roommate, uh, who's also a writer. Do you think a workshop is vitally important, or to you? Um, I think, uh, yes, for me, a workshop is often important only because it's a way to hear the world and, um, and to and to welcome sort of all, you know, all the characters that I'm writing, I'm, I'm inviting somebody to advocate for each of them in a workshop. And so then I can hear maybe from each of them in a way that I can't when I'm by myself. So for me, it's very important. That doesn't necessarily mean that all of the people with whom I'm collaborating in a workshop are my like life collaborators. And I think those are, that's a different group of people and something that I've been so curious about and um, actively seeking to understand who it is that, who is really the ride or die collaborators of my yeah. life. Yeah. And, and those, I mean, I think I've found a handful so far, but I'm, I'm always, almost, I'm always using workshops and developments and productions as opportunities to audition people for that, for that position in my life. <laughs> Does that feel like they're very different kinds of artists, like the folks who are your ride or dies, like the, when you're trusting people or listening to people, are they people who are like, oh, for some writers I know it's like, oh, I love this actor. They totally get how to speak my words. I don't have to translate myself for them into them. They just get it. They just show up and kind of speak it and that is really helpful. Or what kind of collaborations are most useful for you? I mean, I think those, those are always wonderful. And, and there are, I mean, I have had the gift of working with so many actors, including my wonderful husband, who is both the kind of actor that gets my language and speaks my words. And yeah, I don't need to translate and also a collaborator with whom I wish to work for my life. And I think the reason why um, he falls into this very selective camp is because it's, it goes beyond sort of him um, being excellent at his job of, uh, and um, the type of artist that gets my work. He also um, is, uh, has a similar curiosity about the world and, um, and philosoph his philosophy about what life is about. I mean, think like deep, deep conversations and questions. We may not agree about them, but um, he has an interest in talking about them and so do I, and that I feel like makes a really special collaboration. And there are other people that I'm starting to work with that I've, I've um, had the pleasure of meeting that are, that see the world in the same way or are curious about similar things in the world that, that make it, um, that make sort of sparks fly when we work together. Um, uh... 
Oh, Rebecca, yes, I'm answering your question about something in the text thing. I see the remarks from Texas. Oh, yes. Um, she wants to let you know that the transference of experience that you talked about is beautiful. She loves that, and thank you. Oh, thanks, Rebecca. <laughs> also, Rachel thinks our questions are great. Thank you, Rachel, as always. <laughs> um, I'm wondering uh, briefly if you can just share, Jessica, a little bit about um, uh, if you can talk about like maybe the play you're working on right now and what you're learning in your process right now that feels most new. Like what is this new play teaching you right now? It could be any, any of those kind of elements. Well, Um, I'm working on a few things. <laughs> so one of the things that I'm working on, I'm in the middle of doing a lot of um, preliminary or uh, conscious document work. So I'm doing more structuring, outlining than ever before. And I've I've gone from in my life being a person that was like always like it'll you know the play will tell me what it is as I go to becoming an um, a staunch advocate for outlines. And then this is sort of like to the next level where I'm editing and re-editing and re-editing and re-editing the outline itself. And that is teaching me, um, it's teaching me so much because um, the sort of leap in my efficiency and in the power of the storytelling that I made from when I stopped being a, like, I'll figure it out as I go to an outliner is sort of, it's doing it again. And so I think the story I'm about to launch into writing is um, much more, it, the, um, it's more creative actually. And I think that a lot of the arguments against outlining is that it takes something away from the creative process. But what I'm finding is um, by dedicating myself to an outline or, I mean, then that word I think is so triggering. So I just say conscious <laughs> document. <laughs> but by committing to the conscious, to the creativity of the conscious document and letting it flow through the way a script would flow through while I'm writing characters. Um, it, I'm just amazed at some of the interesting, unique details that are starting to come through as I keep revising it. So that's that's what I'm learning right now about that. That actually I could spend a little bit longer in the world of conscious writing before script writing. It's interesting. Josh Wilder was teaching uh, a week or so ago a lot and using uh, *Raisin in the Sun* as an example of really just looking at how structure can free your writing. And I think sometimes we imagine that if we just create cre be work like creative enough, like all of the <laughs> things would flow and then you know, all of that. And I think sometimes having those, you're talking about ritual in terms of writing process and, and all of that, but also some things like outline, like structure, like things that are the, the, the way that we go back to organizing our thoughts. Um, uh, really helpful. I also feel like, I mean, this is separate from theater, but I feel like with all of our friends that are also writing TV right now, there is a there is a thing that they're like. There's a lot of people that are like, hey, actually, like some structural stuff is really useful. <laughs> to have an external skeleton of the thing that I'm building off of. It's not how I want to always do process, but there's some learning in that as well. I'm curious, have you written in other forms than theater, and and what do you learn from those forms? Yes, I mean, and yes, I think the. Um, it's like outline structure breaking a story they're all it all feels so dirty as a playwright but it is <laughs> but it is it's um it works for a reason it it gives people a common vocabulary we all know where we're headed um and and then there's this i don't know there's just the the thing that i mean the reason why playwriting as a form of creative writing spoke to me in the first place, I think is because of the structure of it, because you have nothing but action and that's what you get to tell a story. That's it. You have to like tell a whole story using action. And I think I love the challenge of it. And so I, then if, you know, if I also have to have, you know, a satisfying conclusion, I have to have action and, and a satisfying conclusion, then that is, that's another like little constraint within which I can sort of be as expansive and creative as I want to be. Um, 
Uh, thank you for questions so far. Jess, I'm curious if there's anything else that you want to talk about today that um, is on your mind right now as you think about going forward into the world and you think about new forms of process. Is there something for you that you want to share with us about maybe just a suggestion or an idea that you're going to take forward into the world when you think about creating work and process and um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. What, yeah. do you, what are you taking into the world? Um, uh, there's this word entrainment that I love and the idea of, I mean, I'm sure we, but I'll just say what the word means to me. <laughs> it's basically the way birds fly in a flock or the way that um, a person who has been away from their family can come home and sort of join in with the group. It's sort of like a, a way of sensing the reality around us that we're moving into and then aligning ourselves with it. Mm -hmm. That's what the word entrainment means to me. And, um, and I am thinking so much about that and about how I've always, I've always hoped my work is in some way um, a part of a part of that, a part of um, a weaving into what the forward momentum of society can look like and um, not wanting to come in and dictate, but also, but to come in and joyfully create together with other artists and thinkers, the future of our world. Mm -hmm. And, um, and for me, I think entrainment is a big part of that. It's listening and sensing and then sort of gently moving alongside the current forward. And as I think about process, but also as I think about life, I think this is a big moment of um, where we can be listening to what is needed um, as, as human beings and also as, um, as creatures living on this planet with other creatures. We, I think that this is a moment where we can learn how to align our behaviors better with each other and with the world around us. And so it's a bigger, it's a bigger answer than just in terms of my process, but I am thinking a lot right now about how to listen to the feedback of the planet and of our community and our many communities. Um, this is a question from Sue Schleifer. Sue, thanks for joining us today. Um, the question is on the topic of the note, what kind of notes do you find most helpful for your work? When you give notes to others, what do you try to provide the playwright? So, so great. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, what I find most useful usually is when people tell me what they remember about a thing that they just heard or um, what uh, and less than like in what's impactful or what did I like or what, what, what did I dislike? It's what do I remember and what was I confused about? Because um, sometimes people will, re will remember things that aren't in the play and that's very important, useful information. But also it seems like um, when I'm hearing about the things just that people are tracking, it helps me sort of build out what the experience of encountering this play for the first time might be. And that's really important and useful because I am, you know, 400 times through it and I don't know what it's, what it's like to witness it for the first time. Um, and, and those types of feedback I find to be, um, like the more the more descriptive and the less the less um, judgmental, not like in the judge, you know, but the less like I liked it, I didn't like it, I liked this about it, I didn't like this about it, but the more just descriptive of what it was, the more useful it is to me. Um, and I also so I like to I try to give that kind of feedback to others. And the other thing that I think is useful is like sort of when I'm working with somebody who wants to get in the trenches with me, it's going through the logic of it. Um, together, whether, you know, my play or their play, but if A plus B equals C, then what does C plus D equal and how do we, what is the, the story telling us ultimately about life? Um, yeah, those are the types of notes that I find the most useful. 
Or what is your dog telling you about life? I know, she, she is telling me right now that there's a squirrel outside and she's very anxious to go chase it. Yes, and who can blame her, really? <laughs> um, here's another question that, that just came in uh, from Julia. Uh, wondering if you can talk about things that you've learned from giving feedback to others, um, which is a little bit what you were just sharing just now, becoming someone else's ride or die. Um, <laughs> and knowing that a lot of writers are trying to make community with one another virtually, especially right now, virtually with writers groups and et cetera, how do we train our brains to learn by giving feedback as well. So maybe the question is, yeah, um, things that you've learned about giving feedback to other people. So that, that, that in verse that you're talking about right now a little bit, and then, yeah, especially maybe in a virtual moment where the, the cues might be trickier, like in a writer's group, or if you and I were working on a play right now. Yeah, and I, I, I wonder if you don't mind answering this question too, Jeremy, because I'm so, you, you are in this relationship so often. I'd really love to hear what you have to say. I'll, I can put my mind to it, but do you have anything that comes to mind? You know, um, I think one of the questions that I'm talking with writers about a lot right now, of course, is everyone's thinking, well, I wrote this thing six months ago, but now what it means is totally different. So I, I'm questioning my own, the stakes of my own play or the, the consequences of the play or how it will be felt because it doesn't matter that I wrote it in January of 2019 or January of 2020. The truth is if anyone's going to see it in, you know, October of 2021 or whatever, um, they're going to be feeling different things. Their filter, their lens through which they're watching the play um, is going to be really different. And so um, I think, um, Maybe as I'm thinking a little bit about feedback right now, um, it's trying to have, I don't know, I'm, I'm finding it, there's a, there's a, I'm thinking about a recent example of talking with a writer about like how to write more deeply into yourself than you ever have before. So that the challenge is not like, are you writing every day or anything awful like that? <laughs> like, <in terms laughs> the pressure around it right now but that actually qualitatively maybe the and I'm thinking of actually as another writer who we're talking about this with recently which is like I want to write into this play I actually feel like I know where this play is now more than ever but I'm worried it's sad mm. or worried that you know this or that and and I think my instinct right now just about the work of its own accord is this is an opportunity to remind us that like as you're saying this is an oppor it's a gift we I mean like for so many people who come with so many different life experiences to this work, um, it's not easy. And, and, and there, as you said, there might not have been a natural path to get there. Um, and so if anything, this moment, I think I'm, I'm finding myself sharing with writers like, yeah, I see you're going 40% of the way into the play here. I'm challenging you because who knows if you're going to have four workshops of this thing. So mm -hmm. I'm telling you today to go 87% of the way. What would that look like? If you're telling me your instinct is that the play lives here, go all the way right now and see what happens. We always have a save as. The save as is my sort of feedback, <laughs> um, you know, life preserver. It's like, it, if the thing doesn't work, even as you were talking about in the experience, you know, a few minutes ago, you have the draft that exists right now that you can know and trust. And so um, I think those cues are really critical, those, those in the moment cues with one another. Yeah, I, I have a, a writer friend, Eleanor Bridges, who was talking about um, how she just makes work that she can stand behind in 50 years. And that I think, I, I really, I loved the way she put it because I believe that so fundamentally that I, I'm never writing for right now anyway. <laughs> it takes so long to make a play and it takes so long for it to even in a, in a economy in um, a, a ecology that is before COVID, it took so long for plays to see the light of day. And so why not write the thing that you want to stand behind in 50 years? Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh and in terms of then how to collaborate and make community, it's like, are we, are we 50 year 
people together? Are we, are we working on, like, am I, do I stand behind your play in 50 years? Do I stand behind my note in 50 years? I guess maybe that is just what I would say is, um, I think a lot of times in writers groups and um, moments of feedback, people say things just to say things or worse say things to prove they read it. <laughs> so I think I just want to make sure that in this moment in particular, but maybe always, that I just would stand behind the note I give 50 years into the future while this play is having its full, beautiful life. Um, as we kind of come to a close here in the next couple of minutes, um, I, uh, you were talking earlier about the, about uh, about the dreams of the paper dreams of Harry Kim and, um, and having read and heard so many drafts of it and seen it <laughs> all of that it 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 is a play where as you talked about at the beginning I I watch your whole spirit kind of coalesce into itself in a beautiful extraordinary poetic way and um, this morning, I was thinking about the play, and I opened it just to kind of reread some parts of it again. Um, and so it's probably an older draft of it now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there was a piece of it that I pulled out, and it really haunted me um, in the way that you're talking about, about like, what, what I feel like this play can live on or something beyond this moment for me, but maybe also speaks to the moment. Um, so I'm just going to read a tiny little bit of your play back to you. Jeremy, what a <laughs> gift. This is the poet in the middle. It's totally out of context, but I, I've always loved this language. So, um, And the poet says, do you find me? Do you help me? The last friend you had who knew your name, the one who vanished with no explanation. When a man with a coat turns a corner, do you think this is him? My friend, finally, it's not me. It never will be. I am only the yellow peril, a poor man with no option whose vengeance was denied. And no one, not you, not anyone, will ever know the end to my story. And I think about how the play ends and how it harkens back to this moment in the text. Mm. And I think about how not only the play speaks forward in time, but how it speaks, how the, how the element of time plays out in your play and how these kind of go there. And I think, oh, right, this is a writer who really learned to trust her voice. This is someone who understood the layers, the tissues of what she was writing over time. And um, the poetry that you trust what is haunting and haunted about your work, I think is extraordinary and unique um, for you. Uh, Sue, the name of that play is called The Paper Dreams of Harry Jinn. And you will be seeing it on more and more stages <laughs> all around the country. Because we're to play. Um, thank you for letting me share that with you today. Jeremy, that was so wonderful. Thank you. It's so what a what a treat to hear <laughs> hear work like that read back to you. <laughs> and in this moment too, I just am so grateful. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up here um, and really thank you for your amazing work. Um, and just say a couple more quick things if you're interested again in joining us for more of these conversations with brilliant artists like Jess and, and hearing from other folks, reading some stuff, please feel free to sign up online. I know a lot of them are saying sold out because we have like hundreds of people signing up for everything. Um, but we uh, really are trying to get everyone in the best we can. So please persevere. Um, and also please stay tuned. We keep announcing we have some amazing artists coming up in the next uh, a month or so and we're really excited to share them with you and for them to share themselves and their work with you as well as we go through this um, and um, I, I just want to say again I think um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take your dog's note about the squirrel outside <laughs> the window right now and saying that the world <laughs> delivers us exactly where we're supposed to be for all the reasons that we don't understand right now and that there's a gift in the process of making art and that the theatrical form is largely one where we collaborate with other people and that we trust our instincts and that we stay learning, stay attuned to the things we don't yet know and the world will reveal itself if we just sort of get out of the way sometimes. Jess, thank you so much for being with us today. It's so good to see your face <laughs> and it's so good to see all of you. Please do stay tuned and, and join us at the Player Center for so much more. 
Um, we're excited to be connected with you as best we can during this moment in time. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And we'll talk to you all soon. Thank you, Jeremy. This was such a joy.